Cheers. Cheers all and welcome. Thank you, Anna. Um, and thank you all of you for, for joining us this evening. Um, it's great to see, uh, to see people coming in. Um, and I have the, the real pleasure of introducing our two speakers uh, from Simonsich tonight. Um, we have Johan Malan, who is the second generation of the Malan family at Simonsic, which, is, which sits just north of Stellenbosch. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna hear much more about the estate and its position and all about it from the family uh, in a little while. Um, and I think I'm right in saying, Johan, that you are um, just coming towards the end of your 30, 41st vintage um, at Simonsic. is that right? Uh, I think it's it's thirty nine. Um, thirty nine. Right, close okay. to, to forty. Yeah. Thanks very much for for having us and good evening, everybody. Yeah, it's a it's yeah it's it's a pleasure. So Johan is going to talk to us, um, take us through the the tasting in a little while, which actually includes um, two additional wines. So until today, we were only offering two wines on our website: the uh, cups of Onkel and the France Milan Cape Blend. Um, but one has literally, a further wine has just arrived, a Pinotage, um, just in time for an email that's going out about Pinotage very shortly. Um, and we've also um, made available earlier um, another Cap Classique wine, which is going into our May list. So we're going to be looking at four wines uh, in a little while. And hopefully that'll give you a taster of, uh, of things that you can look out for a bit later. Um, but before your, Johan takes us through those, um, Lisa Marie, who is um, basically looks after the whole of Europe and is my main contact, uh, regular contact at Simulzik, is going to give us some background to the estate, um, to Stellenbosch, to the region, and some of the history that makes Simulzik so special. So Lisa Marie, welcome. Let's start with you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everyone. It's absolutely um, a great honor to be here tonight. Um, uh, I met Joe, I think it's almost two years ago. Uh, we we um, met up at, um, in, in the UK. So I'd also want to thank the Wine Society for the support they've been giving us. So it's really great to be here. Um, and it's, it's very nice to, um, I feel honored to be um, presenting a bit about Simon Sich um, next to Johan. Uh, I started at Simon Sich Wines about two and a half years ago, and it's um, really been a fantastic journey to work with Simon Sich and the Milan family. So I'm just going to take you through um, a bit of the background, and um, I'm sure we, you know, um, Johan during the tasting, he'll fill in. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can start. Okay, um, I think, um, I, I'm not sure how many people we've got on there, but I see um, some familiar uh, people already said hello to me. I've got somebody from uh, Stockholm, which, which um, she's a uh, fear, she visited the farm, um, and it's really nice. And I think that a lot of people um, in the UK, especially what we've been through um, in the last uh, year with all the bands in South Africa, the UK um, and the people has been absolutely fantastic and so supportive of South Africa um, and our friends um, also supporting Simon Sakwan in particular. And we just want to thank, uh, thank everybody for their support. Um, yeah, sure, South Africa is, is you know, we, we always say it's a new world wine um, or wine from the new world. Um, but actually, you know, if you look at when the first wine was produced was back um, in 1659 and and why we can be so specific uh, about the date is that um, uh, um, Jan van Rubiek, he was a navigator and uh, first governor of, of Cape Town and he founded Cape Town in, in 1652. He actually set off, I think, at the end of sort of December 1651 with his wife and, and the main reason for um, him going to Cape Town was uh, to basically oversee the setting up of a refreshment station for the ships that were gonna go you know, on their way to the East and India and to supply them fresh, uh, fresh, fresh food. Um, so the first vineyards were planted in, um, in the Cape in 1655. And then Jan van Rebeck actually wrote in his diary um, on the 2nd of February, 1659, that wine was first made in, in the Cape. 
Um, but then obviously things evolved and it's when um, the Dutch didn't really have a lot of um, experience with um, viticulture, but it was when the French Huguenots came in 1680 to 1690 that they established and brought a lot of um, practices over to South Africa. Um, and yeah, and, and I think that, yes, we've been making wines for a long time, um, but as we all know, basically the wine industry really opened for South Africa uh, when democracy, um, you know, when it was when, uh, in from basically from 1994, winemakers started uh, traveling a lot and um, a lot of um, expertise came into, into South Africa. And a lot of the winemakers brought a lot of expertise back um, in, in to South Africa. So really the world opened for us after 1994. Um, so mostly, mostly um, I don't know, like I said, I can't get sort of a show of hands how many people has been to South Africa, uh, but, you know, mostly of the vineyards are planted in the Western Cape. Um, if you can sort of look at the red area, you see that um, Stellenbosch is just to the right of that, um, and that is where Simonsich is situated, um, and most of the wine growing regions is situated sort of on the West Coast, and a, a little bit to the East Coast, but mainly situated around the Western Cape because obviously being a Mediterranean climate, um, best grown for grapes in that region. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, I think this is sort of iconic, um, beautiful table mountain. Um, yeah, and obviously we have, you know, a lot of people think, you know, Cape, Cape Point, um, is the most southern tip of Africa, but it's actually Cape Agulhas where the uh, Indian and Atlantic Ocean come together. Um, but we're very lucky where we are. We are situated, I think we can go to the next slide, uh, where we are situated in Stellenbosch is only just back, sorry, yeah, um, 40 kilometers east of Cape Town. And that is really the region that I think a lot of people are um, know as the premium wine growing region of, of South Africa. Um, we've got perfect climates. We've got also the cool air coming from False Bay. Um, and this is also Stellenbosch where, um, like I think when, when Joe introduced Johan, um, um, Johan is second generation, but his son is also um, at the farm now, third generation, a winemaker. But his father, Franz, Johan's father also started with some um, other wineries. They started the Stellenbosch um, wine route back in 1971. So we are also celebrating um, fantastic milestones this year. Uh, and one of them is um, the first production of Cup Classic, uh, which Johan will talk more about, but also establishing the wine route in 1971. Um, uh, Simonsich is a private uh, owned uh, um, winery owned by the Milan family. And then the very first wine that we produced at um, Simonsich was in 1968. And that was a Blanc, um, as well, it was known as Stien then. So three years ago, Simonsich celebrated 50 years of producing the first um, Simonsich wine under the Simonsich label. Um, Simonsich where the name comes from. So um, I don't know if it's behind me or behind Johan, but uh, the Simonsburg, um, so basically Simon, which is the governor of, of Stellenbosch, Simon van Estel or Simon van Estel, um, and then the Simonsburg mountain was named after him. So it's basically the view or to have a view. Um, so Simon Sich means yeah, to have a view. Um, and on the left is Johan's brother, they are both managing um, the farm as owners and partners. So, um, yeah, Johan looking after uh, the seller, director of the seller, and Johan um, uh, also looking after the farm and jointly they, they run Simonsich at the moment. Um, and that's not, no, that's not all, there's more family that is joint. Um, so we're talking about three generations now. On the left, you have François Jacques, He's in marketing and data analyst, and he's um, son of Franchot. And then Michael's son behind um, Johan, uh, he is a third generation winemaker, and he looks after all uh, the making of the red wines. 
And then Christelle behind Francois, she is in the financial department. Okay, yeah, like I mentioned, the Mediterranean climate, so it's very similar to the south of France, um, where we have um, uh, winter rainfalls, and most of it, we were, maybe you remember the last maybe 12, 18 months ago, we were really in a terrible drought. Uh, we've been, it was absolutely devastating, and uh, I think at that stage, we, we, the dams were empty, we were we were really closing in on, on day zero. Um, and now we've had fantastic rainfalls last uh, winter. The dams are full, the vineyards are looking beautiful. Um, so yeah, we've, we've really um, had fantastic winter rains last year, as I mentioned. Um, and we've got, if I say sort of mild summers, average temperature 22 to 28. Um, I live in Paul, which is about 30 minutes from Stellenbosch. But today we had 31. I'm not sure, Johan, what your temperature was today. Um, but now officially we've gone into autumn <laughs> from today, I think was the day. Um, but we've, we're really experiencing fantastic weather. It's still really nice and, and, and hot. And we've in, um, in winter, we've also got very moderate evening temperatures. So there's not a huge difference between the day and the night temperatures. And it's, it's really perfect conditions for growing premium grapes. We can go to the next slide. Yes, um, I think when it comes to, um, I'm just gonna go over this quickly because Johan, when it comes to the wines and the soils, I think you'll you'll um, elaborate a lot more on that, but um, the vineyard soils in South Africa are some of the oldest vineyard soils in the world. Um, and yeah, it decomposed over millions of year called table mountain sandstone. Um, and also what is so fantastic about the soils in South Africa is that also, sorry, in Stellenbosch where we are, it's very diverse. Um, and I think that that also gives the real complexity in the wines. Um, and, and sometimes on a, on a, in a vineyard, you can get very much different blocks, different soils that obviously gives you the complexity in the different wines. So um, yeah, and now you can see the high mountains in, in the background. Uh, this harvest, yeah, normally it runs from January until March. We've got about 12 weeks. Um, this year, our harvest started quite late. I think it was um, almost two weeks, uh, 12, 12, 12 days, two weeks late. And then um, we didn't really have the very hot December that usually um, that we have and the hot January that precedes the, uh, the harvest. So this year, it was a cooler cooler climate and cooler weather. So that's why the harvest um, is late. And if I remember correctly, I think there's about, I think it's the Shiraz and the Cabernet, if I'm right, Johan, that's still, uh, that we still need to harvest. Um, so normally uh, Easter is quite early this year, but yeah, I think we'll probably go um, well into Easter. Um, and so it's definitely gonna be longer than the end of March this year. Um, as I mentioned, Johan oversees um, all the cellar and the production and everybody in the cellar, he heads up that whole um, department. In the middle, we have Charles Skuman. He's our winemaker for white wines and Cutler Sick. And then Michael, Johan's son, third generation, uh, looks after all the red wines. And what is very special about Simon Sech is, is that um, firstly, we export to about 45 countries in the world. Um, and something that's extremely important is that we have uh, the control over the quality in everything that we do. So um, when we bring out in the, the, the grapes, when we harvest um, and we make the wines on the farm, uh, we, we bottle it, um, we label, everything happens on the farm. So when the first grapes comes into the cellar um, from the town, actually the container, uh, goes and gets loaded, um, like for instance, um, to the UK, we've got control over the whole process. So that really is, is very good for, for quality assurance and that everything is done um, in-house at Simonsa. Um, as I mentioned, the first wine was labeled in 1968, that was the Chenin Blanc. Um, and yeah, um, there's so many things I was actually looking and say, uh, seeing that 
Um, apart from um, this year, we're celebrating 50 years of making the first cup classic and the starting of, of the, um, the wine route. Um, it was also, it was actually 60 years ago that the first pinotage in South Africa was made. Um, it was launched in 1961. It was actually a 19, I think a 1959 vintage from Lanzarak, um, but this year pinotage and I'm mentioning it because we're going to taste uh, one fantastic pinotage tonight, my favorite Red Hill pinotage. So it's 60 years um, since the first pinotage was launched in South Africa. Okay, so you can see there the very first, um, yeah, I think Johan can um, again give um, maybe more uh, information about this, but um, I think why his father started uh, labeling his own is that you know, it was very difficult to get the prices that you you really knew and 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 absolutely um, um, yeah knew that your wines could get better prices because of the quality. And then um, Franz Milan decided to um, bottle wine under his own label and to sell it direct to the public. And it was Johann's mother um, that labeled the wine by hand in 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 the kitchen. And you can just see on the right hand side some, some examples of the very early wines. So pioneer of the winelands, yeah. Um, I think so many things happened uh, here at, at Simonsach and Franz Milan was definitely a pioneer. He was innovative. Um, he was definitely far ahead of his times. Um, and then when he traveled to, to France um, or when he traveled to France, he's, he, he the idea became that he would um, start a wine route um, and it was Spear um, and Johan, maybe you can unmute. It was, it, it was Simonsich and Spear um, and another two wineries that started the wine route. Delheim. And Delheim, and Delheim in 1961. But the, the big achievement was that um, after he came back from Champagne, uh, he decided that, well, well, if the French can do it, definitely he can also make a bottle fermented sparkling. And then it was called Carps of Fonkel, which means Cape Sparkle, um, literally translated. And then the method, which we then say method, Cap Classic, the method was, um, we could say, traditional method from the Cape. So um, it is also now 50 years that Simon Sich put Cap Classic on a map. It was the birth of Cap Classic, um, bottle fermented sparkling. Um, and then as association or collab co uh, collaborate um, uh, effort, the association is obviously also celebrating 50 years this year um, of Cap Classic with Simon Sich um, pioneering it. So I just want to quickly go through what we've got um, on offer for you today. So uh, a couple of sick range that we do, we do the Carps of Funkel, which is, which is the brute, which you're going to taste or Johan's going to talk about later. Then we've got Carps of Funkel, a rosé as well. And then our new kids on the block, um, they're actually not, uh, what I'm saying, so they've got a new um, uh, uh, design. And that's the demi sick, our satin nectar brute and our satin nectar um, rosé. And then the one that Joe spoke about, the Cuba Real, which is the 100% Chardonnay, the Blanc de Blanc. And it's the 2017 vintage um, that uh, will be available. That's the one there in the middle. So that's the range we offer um, these five um, bottle fermented French style. Um, well, I always say like champagne method, but um, cup classic, 100% bottle fermented. And in South Africa, you have to have um, a minimum of 12 months on the lease. Um, and Simon Sikh, we have at least 15 months on the lease because we degorge as, as the market. So maybe later in the vintage of the release, you, you might even find, um, you know, it's been fermented maybe 15 to, to, to 17 months later in the vintage when it gets released. Then we have another, what we call our cultivar range. We will not really um, linger too long on this one because we're not tasting these wines tonight, but we have a fantastic variety of other still wines from a, a Chenin Pinotage Rosé to a, a beautiful um, Cabernet uh, from Stellenbosch called the Labyrinth Cab, um, and a Gewurztraminer, which, which we've um, had well, 
Chenin Blanc, which we're very well known for, um, and obviously Pinotage and a Shiraz as well in that range. Then the next slide, um, which is the Milan family selection. So these are the wine that are um, very vineyard specific. Um, it is uh, the top of the of our of our um, range. Um, we have a Chenin Abek Shen, which is a, um, a wood fermented um, uh, Chenin Blanc. Then we've got uh, tonight. We'll focus on two of the wines. The one is the um, and then we've got, which is a Cape blend. And then we have the Tiara, which is a Bordeaux style blend. Um, and then we've also got a Syrah. And then we've got um, a Noble Eight Harvest as well, um, called the Vindeliza. Um, so we all, Johan will talk, talk more about the Regal Pinotage. Um, something that's very close to our hearts um, on the farm is our social community um, development. Um, a lot of our people that work on the farm were born on the farm. Um, they work on the farm. Uh, I want to give an example of our brand ambassador that works in the Western Cape, Denzel. He's, he does a lot of tasting for, for, for me as well um, online in the UK at the moment. And he is absolutely, um, he was also, he's, the passion was, was, um, came from, from basically being on Simon Sech and his passion for wine came came from there um, and he started in, in, the, um, in the tasting room and then he was promoted to brand ambassador. He was born on the farm. We do a lot of community work. Um, we have a creche as well so that the mothers can leave their children at the creche while they go to work. Um, we also have a early learning facility where um, some of our partners, um, our agents um, in, in Switzerland They've given us some computers so the kids can come back from school. They can do some homework there while the parents are still at work. So we've got an aftercare facility as well. Um, and then we've got a workers trust as well um, that we try to really uplift the people on the farm and in the community. Okay, I think. Yeah, and then we've got, um, we um, are certified. Um, I think it's very important to the certification of, of um, the wine board service, wine and spirits board, is that it's very traceable. So, and I think that South Africa, if you look at the, at the neck of the bottle, you can see that there's a number and that number can be traced that you know, whatever we state on the label, the vintage, the cultivar, the wine of origin is exactly that. So it's very traceable. We're also part of the inter integrated production of wine um, and Vita as well, which is Ethical Trade and Initiative of South Africa. Um, we've got all those accreditations as well. And I think that, um, yeah, please uh, follow us on, on Instagram um, and uh, support us. And um, I'm going to leave the wine tasting now over to, to Johan, and he can fill in where I've missed out. Um, and please enjoy the tasting with Johan. I think you're unmuted, Johan, so we're ready when you are. I'm ready. Perfect. Can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Sorry, say again. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. <laughs> so, Johan, I think you were going to talk to us a little bit um, to start with about, well, well a sort of tasting or a, an explanation of the Method Cap Classique, the two styles that we have this evening. Is that correct? That's right. Um, yeah, Lisa Marie touched on it that my, my father, uh, he really loved traveling. So on one of his trips to France, uh, went to Champagne and um, came back with the idea to do something similar in South Africa. But, you know, if you if you think of the South African industry uh, 55, 50 years ago, uh, there was uh, no, uh, none of the international noble varieties were actually available to be planted in South Africa. So that was before the time of, of Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, um, 
Ryan Riesling, as we call it, even Merlo, I think, only arrived uh, much later. So his first efforts uh, for Kapsafunkel was basically inspired by the, the fact that he was very limited in terms of uh, the wines that he could offer to his, his uh, wine consumers. Um, and our first wines were mostly sold um, by mail order, very much like the, the wine society's model of today. And um, so he had uh, three white wines, uh, a Stien, Shannon Blanc, a Riesling, uh, the, the, the so-called Cape Riesling and a Claret Blanche. And then in the first red wine came in 1970, which was a Pinotage. So um, he wanted to offer uh, a wider uh, uh, variety of different wines. So because there was uh, no Chardonnay Pinot Noir, he made the first Carps of Funkel in, in 1971 with uh, using Shannon Blanc. So maybe more like a, a, a Loire style uh, Mousseau from, from Vouvray. And um, so that was the, what he had available. And um, the wine was then released, I think somewhere in 1972. And at that stage, it was uh, the, the most expensive white wine in South Africa at three rand a bottle. So um, if you think that our first uh, steens were sold for six rand a case of, of uh, 12 bottles, so it was quite a bit more expensive. Um, but I think he, he um, took a big risk to, to go into uh, making Meto Champenoise. Nobody else had experience and know-how. And basically, he had to, to teach himself and uh, the first few years, it was really quite small scale, um, but it took 10 years before the second producer uh, joined him and also uh, released uh, uh, Meto Champenoise. Um, I, my first vintage was 1982, and I immediately recognized the fact that, you know, in order to, to uh, stay ahead or keep up with uh, this new category that everybody was now getting on board, I had to get closer to the, the proper French champagne. So uh, finally in, in 1987, I had a, a, we had a small vineyard of Chardonnay and a small vineyard of Pinot Noir. So the, the 87 vintage was the first uh, that uh, was made by using the two of the, the three classic uh, champagne varieties. And um, also on, on one of my travels to Champagne, I I wondered why do they grow so much Pinominia and we don't even have it in South Africa. So maybe that is a key ingredient and, and very important uh, for the quality and, and making uh, Meta Champenoise. So in 1997, Carps of Funkel was also the first uh, uh, Cap Classic to include uh, Pinominia or all three of the, the um, champagne varieties. Um, another thing that happened at that time was uh, because I had one little bit of Pinot Noir Cuvée and one small tank of Chardonnay Cuvée, I didn't really know what does a good Cuvée taste like because what you put in the bottle ends up with going through a complete metamorphosis and the time it ends up in the glass, you know, it's very far removed from the wine that you made after the primary fermentation. So I um, thought, well, I must call on my, my colleagues and my, my fellow winemakers of, of the area and um, bring their uh, base wines um, to the cellar. And that was the first one we did was in 1988. And uh, there were only about six or eight of us and we tasted each other's uh, base wines and the amazing thing was that it wasn't as if everybody had secrets. Uh, we were also eager to learn from each other that uh, they um, told everything they knew. And so we learned from each other. And uh, that was unexpected, I think. But I think it's also something uh, very typical of the South African wine industry. You know, it's, it's a small industry it's, uh, and people are very friendly and uh, the, the competition is is actually in the marketplace but not amongst each other and um, that eventually resulted in, in the, the first 14 winemakers uh, who came together we started the an association and 
And this grouping of 14 guys, we said, but we cannot call it champagne in South Africa, or we couldn't even put Meto Champenoise on the label. And uh, so we said, but we must find a name that is that differentiates our bottle fermented wines from the carbonated wines that were, you know, they, they were totally dominant in the market, maybe 98% of the market. So we were tiny. Um, and people didn't understand why they had to pay so much more for our sparkling wine. And uh, so we said, well, it's method traditionnel, method classique, but it's from the Cape. So out of that, and I always say, uh, after many bottles of wine, we came up with the idea that um, Cup Classique is what it uh, will be called. And um, it was uh, just a very small beginning, but uh, you know, if the category has since then has grown now to over 200 wineries uh, in South Africa doing Cup Classique. So I think it's a, it's a wonderful success story that we're celebrating this year. I completely agree. And Joe, I know that you do too. You're a, a big fan of Method Cap Classic wines. I have to say, these are wines that I've been discovering more and more. I think as a category, it's grown hugely. You know, we've we've only featured the wines, these wines occasionally, but I think more and more they're really proving their, their place, you know, I have to say. Um, and I think this, this Cups of Uncle is tasting absolutely delicious it really is um and it's it's lovely to see quite a few people on the chat are saying that they they're enjoying this wine or maybe your rosé which they'll have found somewhere um so no it it, it really is looking super i think and I, th I think we've literally just taken the last of your stock yes <laughs> well we're just so so pleased that you've got it uh, uh available to your um to your members and uh, I hope you enjoy the wine. So uh, have you got, you've got the Carps of Funkel there, uh, I do. the first one. And, it's, and I think if, if I remember rightly, it's majority Chardonnay, isn't it? Just give me a moment. Okay. <laughs> a dog, yeah, <that's... laughs> I think we have a dog, a dog related incident. Um, well, Joe, I also think Method Cap Classique for me is amazing value mm -hmm. as much as anything. Um, I mean, I've, just actually ordered a case of this. Um, it's kind of an everyday sparkling wine drinking price for a really good quality level. And um, for me, you know, there are the places you find that are few and far between around the world when the quality is this good. So yeah, I, I love my method ca classic. <laughs> yeah, Joe, you asked about the, I see your hands back, but you asked, but it's, um, uh, if we're talking about the 2018 vintage, it's 55% hmm. Chardonnay and then 43% um, Pinot Noir, and then 2% um, Pinot Noir. Okay. And then I'm also lucky enough to have the, um, the Blanc de Blanc, which, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, is going into our May list, but we um, brought a little bit in, in advance of that, um, because we were going to be talking about it this evening. So, Johan, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the Blonde de Blonde? Because that's that's a newer wine. You haven't been making that for so long, I think. Yes, um, that was uh, also uh, the result of one of my my travels to to France, and and I visited Champagne. Um, and at that stage, we only had the Carps of Funkel, and it was quite. Soon after uh, we changed uh, the cepage to Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and um, I dreamed of doing like something like a, a prestige cuvee. And um, by then, uh, the Chardonnay was becoming a, a more obtainable, and we had more vineyards in production. So I thought, okay, uh, Blanc de Blanc is, is definitely seen as the almost like the royalty of, of champagne. And I wanted to do something uh, with a 100% Chardonnay. So that's when the, the Cuba Royale was, was, was first made in 1991. So actually that's also 30 years ago um, this year. Um, but the first vintage was only released on the eve of the, the millennium in 99. And uh, quite appropriately, we did that uh, on top of Table Mountain, which was quite a memorable occasion um, 
and uh, quite appropriate, I think. But as we know, Chardonnay is a variety that's, that gives the, the finesse, the elegance and the length to the, to the blend. Um, so on its own, it can sometimes be quite, quite linear, quite shy, especially when it's young. So you need a lot of patience for, for the flavors and the development uh, to happen. And then um, the aim with the Coureur is always to, to have it uh, um, five years old. But uh, this is now the, uh, the 2017, um, and along the way, we, we only do it in the, the really good vintages, um, and we, we skipped a few, which uh, unfortunately, um, it caught up with us uh, a little bit. So now the 17 is, um, is four years old, but it's, it's already starting to show some of that, uh, the creaminess and the biscuity, uh, the, the roasted nuts, um, but it's also a wine that uh, we've got uh, vintages uh, of the older vintages, uh, 2010, 2011, 12, um, that are still in fantastic condition. So that is something uh, about the longevity of of this of the Blanc de Blanc, um, and we also keep the dosage very low. So this wine is actually. Technically speaking, it would be seen as an as an extra brute because uh, the residual sugar is below uh, four grams. So it's it's really somebody once said to me it's oyster dry. So um, that uh, maybe gives you an indication um, that uh, as time goes on, the, the chardonnay just uh, blossoms and it, and more flavor comes out. Uh, and that uh, is what makes it a wine that's really built for the long run. Uh, Johan, um, with, with the UK coming, I mean, um, restrictions are going to be lifted and I think people are going to be outside and celebrating, which I think this is such a fantastic spring and summer um, wine to drink. Uh, what, what do you think that one could serve it with, especially keeping in mind sort of, you know, summer and spring that lies ahead and... and People might be out celebrating. You know, for me, uh, Carpe Funkel or Cap Classique has become really a, a lifestyle wine. It's definitely not a wine that you only have uh, at weddings to celebrate to uh, birthdays and to toast uh, the bride and the groom. It's, it's definitely become a, a wine that people enjoy at any occasion. And, you know, it actually makes any event an occasion. So, um, for me, it's it's uh, is an aperitif before the meal. Definitely helps, you know. It 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 whets your appetite. But um, I think because it's it's got uh, the freshness for me. The it it can be with some uh, you know like something quite simple, like just a grilled chicken, or you can have a, a fresh salad with it, or you can have. Uh, uh, seafood obviously comes to mind, but sometimes, you know, uh, just something very uh, uh, basic like a, like a pasta because um, it needs lighter type food, not big, heavy um, dishes. And that does make it very versatile. Yeah, so for picnics, it's a, it would be a perfect um, pairing, summer picnics. Yeah, especially now with your summer coming on the, in the Northern Hemisphere um, and people can't go to restaurants still there, uh, I believe. Um, so a lot of the, the entertainment and it's not eating out, it's eating in. Exactly. And we're, we're all looking forward to celebrating a little bit more freedom, that's for sure. I have to say this is, it's tasting lovely because... When I, when I first tasted it, I also tasted the 2014, which you were just coming to the end of. So clearly there was a very big jump between those two. And when I tasted, first tasted the 17, it was still quite closed. Um, but it was so pure that, and I kind of had my fingers crossed that, that, that actually come May when we were due to release it, that the wine would really be starting to express itself. But it's it's already looking absolutely lovely. It's it's quite delicate. I love that. I love that in a blanc de blanc. There's a delicacy and a real freshness to it. So I think it's I think it's super. And the, just in case people didn't see the um, 
the bottle properly on the photo. I don't know how well you can see that, maybe not terribly well, but it's a, it's a very handsome bottle too. Yeah. Okay, that's lovely, thank you. Yeah, the, um, you know, the one question I often get is, is how do we compare with champagne? Um, which is always a, a interesting, it made me think, how do we compare with champagne? But I think we, first thing we want to say is we don't try to make a copy of champagne. We uh, use the same grape varieties. Also, sometimes we use other grape varieties like uh, Pinotage, which is what we use in our rosé. Um, and uh, we use the same techniques in the cellar, a whole bunch of pressing, very classical uh, 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 way of doing it, just like champagne, separating the juice into the fra different fractions. Um, for the carbs of Funkel, we actually use uh, some uh, barrel fermentation for the Chardonnay only. Uh, just to give it a bit more depth, to give us a different uh, uh, blending component. Um, but we have a totally different climate in uh, in the Cape. We have a different uh, we have different soils. So even if we try to make uh, something that is a copy of Champagne, I don't think we'll we'll succeed. So what we must do is is play to our strengths, and that is that we have a. Uh, a climate with a lot of sunshine. And uh, I think in Champagne, it's very far north. It's got a marginal climate. So in, in most vintages, it's it's uh, not always that easy to get ripeness. Our biggest challenge often is to, to pick before we get over ripeness. And that is uh, something that I always say that you must taste the sunshine in uh, in the Carps of Funkel and in our, in our Cup Classiques. So uh, the other advantage is the fact that uh, because it's so early in the harvest, you know, we, we just get back from our summer holidays and New Year, um, and then you straight into the vintage with uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So before the summer really gets hot um, in late January, February, we've basically picked uh, the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. So we, we have uh, similar acidities that, uh, that you would find in Champagne. Um, and uh, very low pHs, which is good for the long maturation and development in the bottle. So, uh, but we can go to to higher level of ripeness than than would be perhaps the case in Champagne. So that's a, a one aspect that we are totally different uh, compared to Champagne. And obviously, the soils are also very calcareous and with a lot of limestone. Our soils are different. Um, and that also makes uh, our wines are perhaps a bit more fruit driven, um, where there's a lot more minerality in, in Champagne. But I think that's that's a, a good point of difference. Lovely. We probably ought to move on to the red wines, I think. Okay. Um, do you want to go with the, the, the Red Hill first or the France Milan? Whichever you think is the right order. No, I'll go with the, the Red Hill Pinotage, seeing that uh -huh. it's, uh, it's the younger of the two. Um, this is uh, part of the Milan family selection, the range that's uh, um, all labeled specifically as Stellenbosch, but the Red Hill. The name comes from that part of the estate where the soils have got this iron-rich, uh, reddish color. Uh, so in in Afrikaans, we called it the Roy Bolt, which was translated into the into the Red Hill. And for us, that that's uh, definitely the most sought-after soil types for growing red wines. And um, in, in Stellenbosch, you get uh, two main soil types, which is uh, weathered granites and weathered shale. Now, the, the granites uh, were formed by volcanic action, and the, the shale soils were formed by water sedimentation. So millions of years ago, this was probably the bottom of, a, of an ocean or a lake. And uh, so we have these uh, shale soils at Simonsach, which I... Uh, I've learned over the years, make red wines that are very aromatic and very perfumed. 
uh, on the nose and the and the flavor profile, um, and not so much the the bigger, more powerful red wines you get on the the granite soils. But I think that's you know you can go to different communes in Bordeaux and you also get these uh, variances and there's beauty in in all of it um, or in the different types. Um, the other thing with Pinotage is that, um, you know, it's had a, a quite an uphill battle, I think, over the years, but uh, especially when South Africa started to export, um, there was a, a big shortage and because it was seen as something unique to South Africa, there was a big demand and um, a lot of uh, uh, wines left this country uh, that were not really supposed to, to go out and, and represent South Africa. So Pinotage unfortunately uh, got a bit uh, um, of a bad reputation because of that. But uh, I think since then a lot of uh, improvement has happened and also uh, the uh, Pinotage Association has done a lot to to organize the the, uh, the category and improve quality standards. Um, the the one thing that uh, we do differently with Pinotage is that we grow it as as bush vines or the French would call it uh, gobelet, which is untrellised. So the vines are the structure of the vine is unsupported by wires and posts. So it means that it's got only its own um, uh, branches basically to, to support the fruit. And that is a natural way of, of limiting the, the size of the crop that each vine can produce. Um, secondly, because it's not trellis, the, the berries and the bunches are actually quite close to the ground. Um, and that means that the reflection of the heat coming from the soil uh, definitely creates a, a small microclimate inside each vine because a pinotage has got a, a smallish berry but unlike its one parent is, is Pinot Noir with the thin skin, um, pinotage inherited the, the very um, strong uh, almost leathery skin from the from the Sinzo side so uh, and that contains a huge amount of color and tannin um, so that takes extra time to to ripen and that extra heat coming from the, the, the soil definitely um, helps to, to mature the, the pinotage. Um, so you've got low yields and you've got, you must have good ripeness in pinotage. So quite often you'll see the, the alcohol levels tend to be on the higher side, but it's either that or unripe characteristics. And then uh, in the cellar, uh, we, uh, we like to have open fermentations with, that give you uh, a lot of exposure to air. And um, uh, so manual punch downs every, every two hours uh, from seven in the morning until about 11 at night. Some people go through the night, but um, uh, you need the youngsters to do that. Um, and then uh, not a very long time on the skin. So uh, in our case, we'll, uh, we'll do two, two days of cold soak initially, um, and then uh, the yeast will be added. Uh, sometimes we even, you, uh, we, we may go for a natural ferment. And then um, five days on the skins after the inoculation. Mm -hmm. So that's seven to eight days in total. And that's to avoid uh, the wine coming too tannic and too extracted. So uh, quite different uh, uh, vinification techniques compared to what we do with, with Shiraz and Cabernet Sauvignon. So, um, and then this wine was, was in, in um, French oak for about uh, 15 months and uh, quite a high percentage of new barrels. So, uh, but the, because it's, it's a wine with very intense berry fruit, the, the oak is, is not dominating. It's, integrating and um, it's very much in the background. And I think that's also something that we've changed in the last uh, five to 10 years to, to, write, to rely less on the influence of oak barrels. And I would say that the wine has that same thing in common with the, the France Malan 
a year older, obviously, but again, you've got that, you've got a, a dominance of pinotage. So presumably a lot of the techniques there would have been just the same. And you've got you've got some oak, but it's more than it's more than handled by the richness and sweetness of the fruit. Yes, you know that that is something that um, you know if you if you have a blind tasting and you have to look for pinotage, uh, maybe one of the the trademarks of pinotage is that intrinsic sweetness that you get. So. Um, and as the wine gets older, uh, pinotage, that becomes more and more evident, not sugar sweetness, but sweeter flavors. So that's mm -hmm. ripeness um, coming through. And that is almost the, the giveaway that the, the, if you want to distinguish between a Shiraz and a Cabernet and a pinotage, um, that sweetness is uh, very much uh, its uh, identity. Um, Although I think after 20 to, to 30 years, it becomes very difficult to distinguish between a Pinotage and a Cabernet of that age. Um, and uh, that sweetness is also part of the, the um, philosophy behind the, the Franz Milan blend, um, because that's a blend of uh, mainly Pinotage, but with some Cabernet Sauvignon, as well as a touch of, of um, Merlot. We're very conscious of, of time. We've been enjoying listening to you, but I know there've been lots of fantastic questions coming in. I don't know if, um, if there are any that you've been able to pull together, Anna, that you're, you, can, you can post to, to Johan. Absolutely. Thank you both so much. Well, all three of you, actually. Thank you. Um, and it was lovely to hear uh, so many great stories. I particularly, I have to say, Johan, the thing that touched me the most was that you uh, said the competition is in the marketplace, but not with each other. And I think that really sums up my feelings about the South African wine industry as well. I thought that was really lovely. Um, so questions. Yes. Um, we have our first question, which I think is a, good, uh, a great question. Many people will be wondering it from John Kavanagh, who is wondering so far what the quality of the 2021 harvest is looking like and also the 2020. And I should say, uh, Lise Maureen mentioned it earlier, but you uh, were actually even picking your cabinet today. So thank you uh, for, for joining us and giving up your time mid harvest. Um, but Johan, if you could please comment on the 2021 and also on the 2020, that would be lovely. Yes, um, we are uh, in the home straight as far as the 21 vintage is concerned. Um, and uh, it started much later. So that was already uh, something that was completely different compared to other vintages. So um, Lisa Marie mentioned 12 to 14 days. Um, and our big worry was that, um, you know, if, if the later varieties are not later in ripening, it will be a, like a, a condensed uh, vintage right in the middle. But fortunately that, uh, that didn't happen. So the other uh, characteristic of 21 was the fact that our, our hot February months never happened. So uh, that's normally um, when you get five, six days of, of temperatures in, in the thirties. It never came. So it was actually a cool February, um, which almost delayed the, the ripening of the mid-season varieties even more. And um, everything came in very uh, evenly. So it was never like a mad rush where we felt that we were falling behind or struggling to keep up. Um, and then almost like that uh, major moment in the vintage on the, on the 10th of March, um, the whole Western Cape had uh, quite a bit of rain. So um, more in some places, less in others. So it was a rush for us to finish all the white grapes. So all the Chardonnay, Chenin, Sauvignons, everything was done by then because they are more prone to, to rot. And uh, fortunately we managed that, but then we were, I was desperate to get some um, of the reds in. So, uh, but it was just a little bit too early for most of it, but we did manage to pick up, uh, pick some Cabernet Merlot, Cabernet Franc, um, 
none of the Shirazes were actually ready. Uh, but now that that rain was uh, 12 days ago, we are back with with some really beautiful summer weather. As uh, Lisa Marie said, uh, 31 degrees today, tomorrow might even be a bit warmer. So that's very good to, to dry off and maybe to bring back some of the concentration. Um, so between now and and uh, the end of March, I think most of the rest of the reds will come in. And um, maybe after that, we, don't, we have a, a small vineyard of uh, Morvedre and uh, Grenache Noir, which is, will probably only get to the cellar after Easter weekend. But um, we'll work through the whole of Easter, so it doesn't really matter to us. <laughs> Uh, and in terms, of, in, in terms of 2020, I've seen some really super wines from 2020. How did that go for you? Yes, um, I think 2020 was, was uh, it took a while for it to announce itself. I think initially um, people were not too certain um, and, and what, it, what the quality levels um, are. But uh, from the beginning, uh, if I think of our, our Chenin Blanc, I think a super vintage for Shannon um, and Chardonnay as well. Um, the reds normally take a bit longer time to uh, actually reveal themselves, but now we are uh, a year later, it's, it's quite evident that there's some really fantastic red wines in, in 2020. Um, so we had 15 as one of the greatest vintages ever. Then came um, 2017 and people said, well, maybe 17 is on par with the uh, 15 um, and there's still a, a, a debate going on which one is is better but maybe I think they are at the same quality level but slightly different in in character um, and now 2020 again I think is also one of those uh, really standout vintages. Great Thank news. You. Great to hear. Um, now, Johan, obviously we have spoken about both of the um, red wines this evening, which both, um, well, we have spoken about Pinotage a little, um, but we've had a couple of other questions on Pinotage. And I think the UK um, wine consumer in particular maybe has been burned a little bit by, by Pinotage in the past. And Alistair has asked, um, a lot of South African Pinotage can have overripe banana, or sometimes um, some people get a kind of burnt rubber note. And he asks, how do you avoid those notes in your wines? I think the, um, the overripeness is definitely something that was perhaps uh, around about 2000 and that this, around about the, the change of the millennium. You know, those years were probably very uh, much influenced by the Robert Parker um, preference for very big alcoholic wines with lots of oak. And um, I think it, it didn't only influence Pinotage, but it influenced uh, many wines coming out of the Cape because those were the wines, those big, powerful, almost Swedish wines were very highly rated uh, in the press. And, and I think uh, people thought in order to get a good rating, you have to make wines like that. For, but since then, um, the trend has moved away from that uh, uh, and we're definitely trying to get ripeness but at, at lower sugar levels and there are ways that you can manage that in the vineyards um, and also limiting the yield. Um, the so-called uh, character that, okay, the, uh, of the rubber taint, I think to me uh, that is, is something that uh, is caused by a, a lack of aeration during the, the, the vinification process. And that starts even during the, uh, the fermentation. And we do uh, open top fermenters to get more oxygen into the ferment. And that prevents uh, reductivity to, to form. And, and for me, that is a, a, an off flavor that, that is created uh, by the yeast not getting enough oxygen. Um, and it's, it's not too difficult to avoid it and uh, it should actually not go into the bottle if it does show that kind of character. Fantastic, thank you very much Johan. 
Um, Joe, you've half beaten me to it, but um, I think it's worth discussing openly. Joe's mentioned in the chat a few comments and questions about the cellaring, um, not only of the Red Hill, um, but also of the Franz Milan. Uh, Joe has admitted that she's possibly been uh, erring on the side of caution and been a bit conservative until she has longer experience of a wine. Um, and Johan, since you have plenty of experience of both these wines, uh, would you mind giving members your thoughts as well on cellaring of those two? Well, um, I think, you know, if you look at Pinot Noir, uh, it is a wine with light in colour, very gentle tannins, but boy, can a, a good vintage of Pinot mature. And it does, almost doesn't make sense because you think a wine, in order to mature for a very long time, it needs big tannins and big structure. Um, and I, I always wonder if, if that's not one of the traits that the Pinotage inherited from the Pinot Noir, because in my book, uh, Pinotage can mature exceptionally well. Sometimes um, even you don't even expect it. Uh, and, and that is uh, maybe the intensity of the fruit. So uh, Pinotages do last extremely well. Um, as far as the, the Franz Milan is concerned, is a, it's a Cape blend, so this, this contains mainly Pinotage, about 70%, uh, and 23% um, of Cabernet Sauvignon, and 7% of Merlot. Um, I touched on it earlier that uh, the Pinotage tends to have this uh, sweetness in aroma, um, and as it matures, it, it, it sort of intensifies, but I started this blend and I thought, well, how do you counter that? Um, and Cabernet Sauvignon is definitely not something known for, for its sweetness, but it has got uh, um, beautiful tannic structure and it has a sometimes quite a herbaceous dry finish. And uh, that to me was ex the perfect uh, balancing act that, that would keep the Pinotage in check. So. Over the years, we've done plenty tastings where when where is the exact um, balance when you you put the two together and it doesn't taste like Pinotage, but it doesn't taste like Cabernet either. So it, you always think that the purpose of the blend is to create a new flavor. It shouldn't you shouldn't recognize one of the components. Um, and so at one stage we were uh, in 2003. Uh, it was 45% Cabernet, 45 Pinotage, and 10 Merlot. And I soon realized, but that it was a beautiful wine, but it wasn't a Cape blend because it, it, the Cabernet was dominating. And for me, the, the, the France Milan definitely should have some of that um, velvety smoothness and that, that sweet lush fruit in the middle. Um, oh yes, and of course the, the Merlot is, is like the glue, you know, Merlot in a blend just brings all the parts together, it gives that uh, beautiful uh, very chocolatey flavours on the mid palate, and it makes the whole blend gel perfectly. So um, last week uh, we had some visitors and um, we went out to a restaurant and I thought, okay, um, I need to take something uh, special and I took a 1995 France Milan, um, which was still one of my all time favorite vintages, and the wine was exceptional. So that's what 21 years. Um, so they do last exceptionally well. The good vintages obviously will go a bit further than uh, maybe vintages that are not as strong when they are young. Now, we don't all expect 20 plus year old Franz Milan vintages, but can we come and visit Simon Sieg when we're allowed to? Perhaps with slightly different well, treatment, but to try some wines and say hello. You'll have to come, come to the cellar because they don't travel so well, these old wines. So, um, um, but, you know, one thing that I, uh, it worries me quite often is that um, younger people nowadays don't really have a, uh, a big preference for older wines. Um, and they, they, people are much more used to drink wines with primary fruit that's fresh and immediate and, and very vibrant and lively. 
and you give them something that's well matured and very uh, deep and complex and uh, they, they don't really uh, enjoy that. I have to say at the Wine Society we, we work very hard to, uh, to give them the opportunity to do that. We encourage that very much so uh, uh, particularly with the, the, the classics uh, from Europe, but but from elsewhere as well. So, uh, and, you know, clearly these wines have got, have got cellaring potential, which is, which is wonderful to see. Emma, I suspect we're probably, um, Anna, sorry, we're probably uh, kind of up against it time-wise. I think we are, unfortunately, um, but I'm, I, I'm sure I Liz didn't... Marie might be able to answer a few more questions on email afterwards. So members, if you haven't had your questions answered, um, they will be, I'm sure, don't worry. It was lovely to see in the chat, actually, that quite a few people uh, listening have been to visit you um, and have mentioned just, you know, that you're extremely well geared up. It's a fabulous place to visit. Um, so anyone who hasn't been, um, please uh, take this as a, a very strong recommendation. Um, it's been such a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you, to, to, to see images of South Africa, which I've been missing so much, I have to say. Um, and I have to also to, 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 to give a, a huge thank you to both of you, uh, because not only have we uh, invaded your evening, it must be gone half past nine in, in South Africa just now, um, but it's also a public holiday in South Africa. So you've been working the vintage today and we've made you work on your public holiday. So. Thank you even more for, for giving up your time. It's been wonderful to hear the, hear the story. And I would like to wish you a, a, a good end to the harvest, uh, very importantly, and also a great year of celebration, particularly for Cap Classique. Thank you so much for being behind, for, 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 for starting Cap Classique in, in, in South Africa, because we're, we're all gonna enjoy it this year, I think. Thank yeah. you very much, and to all your uh, viewers and listeners and, and members out there. Um, you know, uh, we're all mm -hmm. expecting and sitting here with uh, big expectations for the British and Irish Lions to come and tour in South Africa. And because and, uh, I, I can still remember 12 years ago, those uh, floods of red jerseys all over Cape Town, you know, so <laughs> we would really be uh, we're desperate to see that again. Uh, so let's hope uh, it still takes place because um, you know it would be a, it would lift the spirits of both sides of the ocean. I think uh, if that can go ahead. Absolutely, but, uh, I'm not sure how many not sure how many English shirts would be there, frankly. But uh, after this these last few matches, but hey, <laughs> we'll we'll be sending some pretty good competition when they do come anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much and in, enjoy the rest of your evening um, and uh, our audience, please enjoy the rest of your wines. We hope you do. Thanks all. Thank you very Thank much, you so much and good night, everybody. Good night.